So we are talking about walking in love, walking how Christ walked. There was a man in a wheelchair who went to a restaurant with some friends of his, and the waitress took the orders of the other people sitting there at the table, and then she asked the other people, what would he like? Do you see what I'm saying? The waitress didn't ask the man in the wheelchair what he wanted. She asked the friends what he wanted. Do you ever find yourself doing that kind of thing? My roommate in undergraduate school was blind. He was completely blind in one eye. That was a glass eye. And he told me that he was about 97% blind in the right eye. It was a... a disease that was slowly deteriorating the, the ability that he did have. There was a Taco Bell across the street from the university, especially on Sunday nights after church. We would stop off at, at Taco Bell and, and uh, get something and take it over to the room. And there was more than one occasion where the cashier would realize that he was blind and then start talking louder. The woman with the fella in the wheelchair was kind of treating the, the, the man in the wheelchair like an object, wasn't she? Not as a person. Now, she didn't intend, I'm sure, to signal that kind of thing, but that was... There's times when Rachel and I are in the kitchen and she may be standing at the island and I need to get to the drawer that she's standing in front of Maybe you do this with your spouse too. What do I do? I typically, typically just bump her. I don't say please step aside like you do a human. I tapped on her like you do an object. <laughs> you know, she just overlooks, which she needs to overlook a lot of things that I do, but sometimes we treat people like they're things and not people. So tonight I want to focus on walking as Jesus walked, loving as Jesus loved, from two different perspectives. One, loving without judging, and the other, which is related to that, loving without self-righteousness. So let's begin in the Gospel of John. You see there on the screen, John chapter 9. John chapter 9, Jesus was walking along, doing his ministry. He saw a man blind from birth, verse 1. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? What is the false assumption in that question? Do what, uh, Marvin? Somebody sinned. This man is blind because somebody sinned. That's their assumption. Now, if the man hears this conversation, what do you think goes through his mind? Have you ever talked to somebody, even in this day and age, who feels like God is punishing them for something they've done? There you go. Geneva says with three handicapped kids, she's asked herself, what did she do wrong? There is a, a name for that belief, and we'll talk about it a lot when we study the book of Job in the summertime. It's called retribution theology. Retribution theology believes that God punishes you for your sins. Therefore, if you are suffering, it's because God is punishing you. Now, those two statements are not cause and effect relationship. They are not related, but we relate them in our minds. If I'm suffering, it's because God is punishing me. But is that, that's retribution theology, but is that biblical theology? 
There's a difference. Look here at this case with this man. My guess is this man is believing the same thing. I sinned, or my parents sinned, and that's the reason why I'm, I've been born blind. So the disciples are asking Jesus this. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? How could he have sinned if he hadn't... If, if, yeah, blind from birth. What did he, he sin in his mother's womb? <laughs> But notice Jesus' answer in verse 3. Sometimes we create alternatives in our mind and both of them are false. And that's what's happened here. That he sinned or his parents sinned. Well, Jesus says, neither one nor the other. There's a third option. Look at what Jesus says in verse 3. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. How would you word that in your words? Paraphrase Jesus' statement there in verse 3. What is Jesus saying? It's not about you. Right. And I really had nothing to right. So Brandon said it's not about us, it's about God. And Linda said she blamed herself for her children's deaths and it it wasn't your fault, was it? He took them because evidently it was their time to go. Yeah. And we, and we don't even have to have the answer, do we? Isn't that what we're going to... Y'all have read the book of Job before. Isn't that what we're going to find out when we say the book of Job? Does God ever answer Job's questions? No. Because it's not about Job, is it? You see, I'm letting the cat out of the bag. But when Satan came to Job to tempt him in chapters 1 and 2, Satan's assumption was... The only reason why Job was faithful to God is because God blessed Job. That was Satan's assumption. And it was a false assumption, and God was going to prove it was a false assumption. And so God, that's the reason why God gave Satan permission to do what God gave Satan permission to do. And in the end, Job stayed faithful to God even though Satan took away everything. Because it wasn't about Job, it was about God. Was God worth serving and being faithful to even if He did not give Job blessings? And we need to remember that. Relative to Geneva's situation, I've got a, a preacher friend in North Carolina who, have, who has a child named John, uh, Nicholas, excuse me, whose name is Nicholas, uh, who was born that, with Down syndrome. And Les wrote an article in one of, one of our Brotherhood papers uh, something to the effect that his son was his best teacher. And that article was a list of things that his Down syndrome son had taught him about life. Jesus here tells his disciples, it's about God. It's about God working in somebody's life. Now, the disciples see that man as a problem. They see him as a tragedy. They see him as a sinner. How does Jesus see him? As a person. As somebody that has a future. As somebody through whom God is going to work, not just in his life, but he's going to work in the lives of the people around him. Let's go on and read verse 4. We must work the works of Him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now that statement right there shows us that Jesus is going to be putting this blindness in a broader theological context. Because in the broader theological context in this chapter, for those of you that are familiar with the chapter, who are the blind ones in the story? 
It's the Pharisees, isn't it? The religious leaders are the ones who are blind. And the blind man can see, spiritually speaking, once his faith is challenged. Let's keep reading verse 6. When he had said this, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and applied the clay to his eyes. Now, personally, I would say, Jesus, that's gross. But I guess if I was having my eyes opened, I would, probably wouldn't say anything. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which translated means sin. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Now, it wasn't the water that healed him, was it? It was God who healed him, but would he have been healed if he hadn't washed? No. Isn't baptism analogous to that? It's not the water that cures, is it? It's not the water that washes away sin, but we have to obey Jesus, right? To be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. So, verse 8. The neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. So, everybody around him is now being challenged. They know, this is, they, they're his neighbors, so they know him. And they know the man's blind. Not only was my roommate blind, but there was a man in the church that we were worshiping with who, who had become blind in his adult years. He had served in the Navy. He had retired from the Navy but he was completely blind at the point I knew him. Um, and, and he had a remarkable memory. He was like Don Tucker. He could quote big sections of Scripture. A very serious student of the Bible. And, and once he became blind, of course, then he spent more time in Bible study. Uh, he, he knew the Word. I learned a lot. At the, his wife's fixed the best Reuben sandwiches. And when you're a college kid and you're having to feed yourself sometimes... You come up with reasons to go have Bible study because <laughs> Martha was going to fix a Reuben sandwich. Uh, but anyway, he, he, he went through his house without any problems because he knew where everything was located. I guess he had bumped into enough stuff. He knew where it was located. So everybody was talking about this blind man here. Yes? Yes. Right. So God wants to work in his life so that he would have a reason to believe in Jesus and that the people around him would have a reason to believe in Jesus. Um, it's it's the, the message that creates faith, but the miracles give reasons to believe the message. And so that's what we've got going on here with this, uh, this blind man. So Jesus shows us here in this uh, example by pausing when he sees this man blind from birth and bringing people's attention to what is going on, especially in this case his disciples. Now, the impact of the miracle is going to be broader than just his disciples, but he's especially teaching his disciples. And so that, that middle point there is we... We analyze people. We don't just analyze ourselves. We analyze other people around us, right? What did that person do wrong in their life to be in the situation they're in? I do it myself. I try not to, to allow that necessarily to impact how I treat them. But don't we tend to start making assumptions? And that's what the disciples have done here in his situation. But Jesus wants to heal. Because Jesus wants the man to come to faith in him. Jesus has the long-term view in mind. You and I tend not to have a long-term view in mind. We tend to just have short-term view in mind. 
And so why do we tend, why, why do we tend to judge rather than love? Why do we tend to judge and not be compassionate? Because when you get involved in people's lives who are having trouble, it is time-consuming. It can, it can drain money. And sometimes you wonder, is the money really being used wisely? Or am I wasting my money? Sometimes when you want to help people, and we had this a lot in Romania, a lot of beggars in Romania, Sometimes when you want to help people, it can be a, a mental drain. It can be a spiritual drain. It can drain your energy. And so we tend, tend to close up our hearts of compassion because we don't want to get involved. We want people to do it our way. And we'll talk about self-righteousness in, uh, in our next example but Jesus here, of course, is tender. He's tender with the blind man, obviously, but he's also tender with his own disciples. He doesn't jump down his disciples' throat. He doesn't accuse his disciples of being judgmental. He directs their attention to the bigger picture, the works of God. And I do wonder what the blind man was thinking when he hears this discussion going on. And, and if he assumed that he was blind because his parents had sinned, what does he think now that he's healed? <laughs> if you assume that you're blind because your parents sinned, or maybe you had sinned and, and, and God anticipated that sin to go to, back to Donna's question, he couldn't have sinned in the womb, but maybe God knew he was going to sin, and so God made him blind. If you assume that was true, but now he's healed, his eyes are open, what does that mean from his perspective? It means he's accepted by God, doesn't it? If his assumptions were true, now probably he thinks, I'm right with God, because now my eyes are opened. Others would wonder what this man did to offend God. People today respond by being offended at God. Right? Don't people today get mad at God because of suffering that goes on in the world? In fact, some people even go so far as to say there is no God because of the suffering that happens in the world. They ignore all of the good that exists in the world that would argue for God. So Jesus saw this situation again as an opportunity for God to work in this man's life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, we're not going to turn there. You can write it down if you want to, but you're familiar with the text. That's where the Apostle Paul says that I've got this thorn in the flesh, and I prayed to God three times that God would remove it, and God said no. Do you remember what Paul said at the conclusion of that discussion? God's grace is sufficient. Paul had gotten to the point in that thinking that he could depend more on God because of the problems that he was going through. The challenges and the struggles that we face in life should move us towards more dependence on God. And if we're dealing with people around us that we tend to judge rather than love then it should, we should see that in their lives as an opportunity for them to move closer to God. Sometimes we're the only God in their lives. Right? I put God in quotation marks. We're God's hands in their lives. We're God's, God's heart in their lives. They may not know anything else about Christ except what we display towards them. So the Pharisees call the man in for an interrogation. They are the moral policemen of the time. So they call the man in. Notice down in verse 24. A second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Do you recall why Jesus was a sinner? Why the Pharisees called Jesus a sinner? He healed on the Sabbath. Now, is it sinful to heal on the Sabbath? Did God say in the law of Moses, you cannot heal on the Sabbath? 
No. But if you roll up your pallet that you're laying on, that's work and that's sinful in the mind of the Pharisees. So Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. Jesus was violating their tradition. And so now they call him a sinner and they call in the blind man, verse 25. He answered them, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They were, they were pushing him into the corner. And, and if we read the whole chapter, we would see that his faith is getting stronger. Every time they push him, his faith pushes back and his faith gets even stronger. He says, I was blind and now I see. Those are the facts. Now he's going to eventually connect the dots with these facts. The Pharisees refused to admit it. Verse 26, they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? It's almost like they're mocking him. Verse 27, he answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? Well, two can play the sarcasm game, can't they? <laughs> so he's obviously being sarcastic towards them. Verse 28, they replied, uh, they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. That's telling. Didn't Jesus say Moses spoke of me? So verse 29, they said, We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man says in verse 30, Here's an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Again, he's being pushed in the corner, but he says, You know what? If Jesus was a sinner, God would not have answered his prayer for my eyes to be opened. My eyes were open, therefore the conclusion is this man's not a sinner. That's what's going on in the blind man's mind. So he sees more than the Pharisees do, doesn't he? And ultimately it's because his heart is more right than theirs. Now the Pharisees through all this whole thing it just has the veneer of politeness. They really are being quite rude and disrespectful, arrogant, and blind themselves. But the man we see here is pretty quick on his feet. Verse 32, Since the beginning of time it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. There is no example in the Old Testament of a person being born blind and being healed there really is no example of a person being blind and being healed. There's one occasion in 2 Kings chapter 6 where God strikes the Syrian army blind. You may remember in the days of Elisha, and Elisha leads the blind army into the heart of Samaria, the, the capital of Israel, and then God opens their eyes and they see that they're surrounded by, by Israelites, and then the king... He wants to kill them, and Elisha says, no, you don't kill your POWs. You feed them, and you send them home. And so the king fed them and sent them home, and they never invaded again. That group, at least, never invaded again. That's the only example of somebody being blind and then being healed, but God blinded them, and then God healed them. So this man says, you can go read your Old Testament, and you won't find somebody being born blind and then being healed. Verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? And so they kicked him out of the synagogue. So the disciples asked, who was born blind, this man or his parents? And the Pharisees said, this man was born blind. <laughs> because he won't jump on the anti-Jesus bandwagon. They're prejudiced against Jesus because they, they don't like it that Jesus doesn't keep their traditions. The blind man is a pawn in their chess game with Jesus. They don't care one whit about him. But he is growing in his faith. He didn't know who Jesus was at the beginning. 
But then Jesus heals him. We skipped over verse 17. Jump back up to verse 17. This is the first interview that the Pharisees had with the blind man. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, He's a prophet. So he goes from not knowing Jesus, and, and now he says he's a prophet. Let's begin reading in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had put him out, that is, they kicked him out of the synagogue. He could not come study the law anymore. He couldn't come sing with his fellow Jews anymore. He couldn't come pray in the synagogue anymore. He found him and he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Okay, so we went from him being ignorant to believing that Jesus is a prophet, and now Jesus says, Do you believe in the Son of Man, the Messiah? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. He goes from ignorance to worshiping. It was a rough path to go. Now, it, it sounds like this all happened in one day. Sometimes we have interactions with people and they're on that same journey, but it might take them weeks, it might take them months, and it might even take them years to go from not worshiping Jesus not knowing anything about Jesus, to worshiping Jesus. But we've got to be careful how we judge them. Be compassionate. Be patient. Let them work through these stages of understanding just like this man did. Verse 39, Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. The blind man was blind, but now he sees, both physically and spiritually. The Pharisees thought they could see. They thought they had everything figured out. They were the religious leaders. They thought they knew it all. But in reality, they were the ones who were blind. John 12 and verse 47, Jesus says, If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. It's not the first time Jesus said that in the Gospel of John. All the way back in John chapter 3, Jesus says, I do not come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. Why, did, why does Jesus say He did not come to judge the world? Why, did, why does He say He didn't come to condemn the world? He came to save it. Why did He not come to condemn it? The world's already condemned. The world's already condemned. The world is already judged spiritually. Because when we sin, we're judged. We put ourselves into a con condition of being condemned by God. So Jesus says, I, I came to save the world. Judging creates separation. Loving like Jesus loves creates unity. It creates community. And that's what Christianity is about, isn't it? Community. Isn't what the, that, what, that is what the church is. The church is a social group, a, a family. Point number two. Loving without, without self-righteousness. Look at Luke chapter 15. We're just going to touch on the parable of the prodigal son, and then we're going to jump back to Luke chapter 7. You're going to hear a lot from the Gospel of Luke this year because I'm doing my own personal Bible study in Luke, very in-depth, and just sharing a smidgen on first Sunday of each month from the Gospel of Luke. But we'll, we'll look at Luke a couple of times tonight. Luke chapter 15 is a parable of the prodigal son. Most sermons that you hear on the prodigal son is focused on the prodigal son. But the parable of the prodigal son wasn't told primarily about the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son is about the older brother. 
In the first part of chapter 15, Jesus gives the parable of the lost sheep. And if you'll notice in verse 7, once that lost sheep is found, Jesus says, well, verse 6, Jesus says the man calls together his friends and neighbors and they rejoice with him. He's found a sheep that was lost. Jesus says there's going to be joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The next parable is a parable of the lost coin. When the woman finds the coin, notice verse 9, she calls her friends and neighbors together, Rejoice with me, I found the coin which I had lost. And Jesus says, I tell you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So the focus of those two parables is about the joy that is experienced when something that was lost is found. When the prodigal son comes home, what is the response of the older brother? Does he rejoice? Does he call his family and friends together and have a big party? He doesn't, does he? Look back in verses 1 and 2. Always look at the context that motivates Jesus to tell his parables. What's going on that motivates Jesus to tell these parables? The tax collectors and the sinners were coming near Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and the scribes, and the scribes almost always were Pharisees, began to grumble saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So who does the older brother symbolize in the parable of the prodigal son? The Pharisees. Who were not rejoicing when tax collectors repented of their greed and other sinners repented of their sins. Now, the older brother had some things to be proud of, didn't he? He never left home. He never wasted his, his inheritance. He never dishonored his father's name. He never did any of those bad things. And that's nice to say that about him. But he allowed that righteousness to become self-righteousness so that he looked down his nose at his brother who came home and he would not even go in and eat with him. Self-righteousness sometimes gets in the way of us loving other people. So I want you to turn to Luke chapter 7. This is the one we'll spend most of our time on tonight. Luke chapter 7. Speaking of the Pharisees, verse 36. Incidentally, the problem with the Pharisees was not that they were concerned about the law. It is not wrong to be concerned about keeping the law, keeping the commandments of God. That is a good thing, not a bad thing. That was not their problem. Their problem was they had elevated their traditions to the level of God's laws. That was their problem. Verse 36, one of the Pharisees, his name was Simon, was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner... And when she had learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. What kind of woman was she? I'm, I, I'm going back behind that. Spiritually speaking, <laughs> she was bad. The text says she was a sinner. That could mean the synagogue had expelled her like they did the, the blind man later on in chapter 9. Probably it indicates that she was a prostitute. When I was in junior high school, I was heavily involved in 4-H, and we were at a state competition in Atlanta, Georgia, one of the big hotels there that has a conference center associated with it, Marriott or something. Late on a Friday night, I was there with my 4-H advisor, and we go to an elevator, and there's a woman there with fishnet stockings, high heels, mini skirt, 
My 4-H advisor said, you know what she does? I was oblivious. How do you... How would you feel, don't answer this, but how would you feel if you're sitting there at this man's house and a prostitute comes up and starts crying on your feet? Your skin shuddered, didn't it? (laughs) What does Simon think about Jesus? You shouldn't have anything to do with that woman. Can you imagine what she does? She sells her body... One of the worst things that could be done. But she comes in and she's weeping over the feet of Jesus and wipes His feet with her hair and kisses His feet. Have you ever kissed anybody's feet? Much like a baby... Theodore's at the point where he's putting, trying to put his feet in his mouth. Can you imagine kissing a stranger's feet? Who was it over here? Uh, Irene said she was thankful. There's got to be something deep going on inside her heart to motivate her to do this kind of thing. Exactly. probably all men. And so she goes in there with her baggage. What would she assume everybody else is doing towards her? Judging her. But it took courage for her to do that, didn't it? But notice verse 39. In verse 39, the Pharisee who had invited Jesus, saw this, what was happening. He said to himself in his own mind, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Notice that Simon is judging Jesus. He is deciding in his heart Jesus can't be a prophet because if he was a prophet, he would be expelling this woman from his presence. Doesn't Simon think more highly of himself than he ought to think? Who in us in here is worthy to come into the presence of Jesus? Back in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus goes out on the boat with his disciples, you know, that's when he's, they fished all night, caught no fish, and so he says, throw the net on the other side. Then their nets were filled with fishes. You remember that VBS song? You remember what Peter and the other apostles did once the net was full? How did they respond to Jesus? Peter said, get away from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Simon doesn't have that reaction. This Simon didn't have the heart that Peter has. So verse 40, Jesus says to Simon, Simon, I have something to say to you. Jesus has not talked to the prostitute, but he's got something to say to Simon. He replied, say it, teacher. Verse 41, a moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. A denarius was one day's salary. It was a coin given to a day laborer after working for a day. Here's your denarius. So 500 denarius is, you know, well over a year's worth of of pay. The other 50, so that's what, a month and a half? A month and two-thirds salary. So when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you've judged correctly. Now turning towards the woman... Mark pointed out last week the number of times Jesus looks at people. Does anybody remember the number? About how many times did Jesus see people or look at people in the gospel accounts? Anybody remember the number? The only reason why I remember it is because I just listened to a sermon Monday. Forty times. 
40 times in the gospel account. Did you get it, Geneva? Oh, you got it? Beth got it? So Jesus draws Simon's attention to this woman. Look at her. And don't see her as a prostitute. See her as somebody who needs God's forgiveness. So turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Notice... This man thought more highly of himself than you ought to think. And Jesus, just off the top of his head, makes a a list of things that Simon, as the host, failed to do to Jesus. He was the host, and he had failed to treat Jesus as an honored guest. Verse 47, For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much, Notice at the end of verse 47, he who is forgiven little loves little. Is that a rebuke of Simon? Simon, you feel like you have been forgiven a little, and that's the reason why you love little. Sometimes our own self-righteousness can get in the way of our loving other people. We think that it's okay for God to love us and forgive us. But it might not be right for Him to love other people and forgive other people. And maybe we don't word it that way, but maybe we just act that way. You see, Simon believed that he would never do anything as bad as that woman. Because there's nothing worse than prostitution, right? Second of all, Simon believed that he was better than she was. He believed that he was closer to the throne of God than she was. And then third, he really didn't think that he needed anything from Jesus. Because he thought he had it all. He thought he had everything all worked out. So verse 48, Jesus directs his attention to the former prostitute. Jesus says to her, your sins have been forgiven. Did Jesus overlook her sins? He did not. He looked at her and he forgave her. We talked Sunday, this past Sunday, about repentance Wasn't her earlier response back up in verses 37 and 38, wasn't that a sign of her repentance? We don't know what she knew about Jesus. I'm guessing she knew that He was a holy man of God and that He was extending forgiveness. Now, in that day and time, in that day and time, when there's no social net, There's no Social Security. There's no Medicaid. If your dad's dead and your uncles won't have anything to do with you and you're divorced or can't get married or whatever, prostitution was about the only way you were going to make money. So from one perspective, she was probably between a rock and a hard place. She did what was easy. In Romania... It is hard for somebody who does not have a network to move from to, to move from being an orphan to being self-sufficient. It's hard. If your parents are not we dealt with a lot of that. In fact, a lot of the people we baptized were in that situation. They were not technically orphans. But if their parents left them on the doorstep of an orphanage because the parents couldn't feed them, their parents didn't have anything to do with them, they're raised in an orphanage until they're 18 years old. At 18 years old, they've got to leave the orphanage. Where are they going to go? There's no support network. 
We have that same situation going on here. Verse 49, those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And then Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That sounds to me like Jesus has forgiven her, He has embraced her, and He has told her, you are on the way to heaven. But Jesus didn't concern Himself too much about what other people were thinking, did He? Jesus was willing to go out on a limb and allow these people to question who He was. But He wasn't concerned about that. He was concerned about her. Who can forgive sins but God? Only Jesus, because He is God, of course, which is my sermon Sunday morning. If, if Donna does Rosetta bad, Rosetta, of course, can forgive Donna. She can say, Donna, I forgive you. But what if I were to say, Donna, I forgive you for what you did to Rosetta? Would that make any sense? How could I forgive Donna for something she did to Rosetta? But Jesus can. Because Jesus is concerned about people. He's concerned about relationships. He's concerned about people being right with God. Simon didn't realize, but we're all in a mess. Or at least we were. Simon needed God's... For Simon's problem... Is pride just as bad as prostitution? To ask the question is to answer it, isn't it? Simon was just as far away from Jesus. In fact, we might say Simon was further away from Jesus than the woman was. The Pharisee and the tax collector, Luke 18. We won't take the time to go read that. The tax collector would not even look as, lift his eyes up to heaven smote himself on the breast and said, God, be merciful to me. The New American Standard says, the sinner. Other translations don't necessarily have the word the in them, but the Greek does. I'm the sinner here. The tax collector was wealthy. The tax collector worked for the Roman government. The tax collector was despised. That's why the tax collectors are almost always associated with sinners, tax collectors and sinners. But that one wanted to be right with God. And Jesus said he went home right in the eyes of God, not the Pharisee. If we're going to love like Jesus loved, we will love without judging. And we will love without self-righteousness. Anybody have any thoughts, comments, or questions? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time we could spend together tonight learning more about your Son, and we pray that you will help us to live more like your Son. Keep us in your care until we can assemble together to, again on the Lord's day. If the snow comes in tomorrow, Father, keep us safe on the roads. Bless us, Father, in the name of your Son, and in His name we pray. Amen.